So here we have Human Reproductive Anatomy and Physiology, Chapter 2. What are we going to learn? Some terminology, um, and then we're just going to be looking at charts, looking at diagrams, anatomy. What's puberty? It's that change from childhood to being able to create more childhoods. Um, it's not just a physical change, it's an emotional change, it's a whole body, a whole person change. Um, secondary sex characteristics, these are the big things. The primary sex characteristics, those are like, ah, a penis, a vagina. Okay, those are, you know, you have it from birth, period. Um, the secondary sex characteristics are the ones that grow with you as you mature through puberty. Um, so testicular, uh, or uh, testicular drop, the male musculature, um, pubic and facial hair, deepened voice. Um, for women, it's menarche, broadening hips, breast growth, and pubic and axillary hair. Um, it's just the signs that you're becoming a physiologic adult. It ends, this is a great thing, because puberty is really, it's our idea of change in the human body. So when does it end? Well, it ends when we perceive the human body as no longer changing. So we say that's when the sperm have matured for men and the menstrual cycles are regular for women. <laughs> Does this mean they're mature? No. Nah. These are the teenagers running around causing trouble. Um, Able to have babies. Exactly. <laughs> the dangerous thing. That's exactly <laughs> it. <laughs> it's not that they're mature, it's that they are able, able to create babies. So the consequences of their decisions have suddenly gone through the roof. Um, celebrated in many cultures as a rite of passage into adulthood, but other cultures will lack the ritual entirely. Just like I said, it is a cultural or per, uh, societal construction or perception, so it is very much based on the society or culture, how they treat it. Um, it leads to confusion for some adolescents in industrialized nations because that's where you oftentimes get divorced from your cultural roots and then are just in this kind of societal blob. Um, so now, instead of hunting or displays of bravery, we have things like going to Burning Man, or I don't know. What do the kids do? My uncle goes to Burning Man, so obviously that's not what the kids do anymore. What's up? A modern day example, so bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah, oh, okay. Or kinsira. Kinsira, the, yes. Or, those, are those are modern rites of passage. Hormonal changes in men begin between 10 and 16, and it really can vary. You might get a 10-year-old who's starting to get that deeper voice. You might get a 16-year-old who's still talking like this, but eventually it's coming down. Um, that's just how life goes. Some people mature a little later than others. Um, hormone levels in men tend to stay constant through time. They might vary in the sense of they're increasing or decreasing but not on a periodic basis. It's not getting more this week, less this week, more this month, less that month. That's something that you will see in the uh, female reproductive system or the female hormonal system. Um, outward changes, just the genitalia in general increase in size. They grow taller faster. They put on musculature faster. If you're 10 years old, yes, you can go and start lifting weights and maybe you're gonna go, oh, thing right there but it's you gotta lift a lot of weights as a 10 year old if you want to build muscle it's just not in your physiology um testosterone levels start to level out and then nocturnal emissions may occur but those are not universal and that's something that a lot of the times gets described as universal um and so a lot of young men will be like oh i've never had a nocturnal emission am i not a man yet no it's just like one of those things that got put on the list of puberty and you know nobody's ever decided to put the asterisk next to it all right there's the anatomy let's see um I'm trying to think if there's anything very specific one thing i do want to highlight the prostate right here so just with what we have with our older populations that you focus on, I know that's not for this class, but it is for this overall um, course of study, the prostate will get bigger for men. That's just kind of a natural with age process. It kind of gets bigger, but the degree to which it gets bigger makes a huge impact. Benign prostatic hyperplasia 
means it's getting bigger to the point that it's getting squeezed closed and you can't pee anymore. And that causes a lot of problems. I would say probably half of the older men at BCC have had um, BPH or have had some sort of treatment for BPH. Um, This is female anatomy, though, or the maternal and child health. I don't know where we're going over male anatomy. Um, let's see. Difference from the female genitalia, like everything is all in one tube compared to the female genitalia. There are multiple external openings or ducts. Um, the purpose of the fetus is depositing sperm containing erectile tissue. Um, what happens? What uh, what actually causes an erection? It's blood getting trapped in the uh, penis itself. Um, so when you're all tourniqueting, I guess you don't technically all have uh, blood draw experience, but like let's say you tourniquet an arm to try and get you know the veins to bulge out. Essentially, the entire tissue structure is designed to start holding blood, and then have a rigid. Uh, structure um, once it gets filled with blood so it's like it's like uh, I don't know like if you had a whole bunch of inner tubes or something for a river and they're deflated nothing you know you can collapse them all together but if you inflate all of them together you could create like some giant long raft it's basically mm -hmm. the same thing um, so it's a lack of blood return so if you have anything that's preventing blood return then it's going to be contributing to erection. Um, and this is where you get things that make blood flow slightly easier can cause erections, like Viagra is developed as a blood pressure medication because it makes it easier for the blood to flow through those capillary beds. And then they're like, wow. I mean, their blood pressures haven't changed all that much, but all these patients and their families seem so much happier. <laughs> all right. Scrotum, um, it's what contains the testes, suspended from the perineum. Uh, why does it exist? To keep it cooler than the rest of the body because sperm needs to be kept cooler than the rest of the body. So you imagine, you know, some chimps running around through the forest, then it's going to be hanging down in the nice AC, going through the air rather than staying up in the body. Um, otherwise, you literally will not be able to create sperm. All right, internal genitalia. Essentially, um, the... <laughs> All right, I have jokes that are crass that I can't make. Um, testicles and ovaries are essentially the same thing. Uh, it's just the testicles descend out into the body. Um, but they're both doing the same thing too. They're both producing the sexual cells for your body. The <laughs> testicles are just producing sperm cells and the ovaries are producing egg cells but they really are literally the same thing. Um, I mean, not literally, but you know, like from an evolutionary biology perspective. All right, um, let's see. So testosterone has a million effects that are not related to sexual reproduction in addition to the sexual reproduction effects. Um, increased muscle mass and strength, promoting growth of long bones, increasing your basal metabolic rate, increasing uh, red blood cell production, enlarging vocal cords, distribution of body hair. Um, I don't know if any of you watched that amazing Netflix documentary series about American gladiators, but you can see all of the effects of testosterone from the women uh, that were American gladiators injecting synthetic testosterone and then having deeper voices, crazy muscle mass, um, much, much higher metabolic rates and having to eat all day long, getting very, very hairy. Um, these are all direct effects from testosterone that they're injecting for the muscle mass gains. But like every other you know, intervention that we have, it has other effects. Um, all right, ducts. <laughs> ducts, fancy word for tubes. Um, the epididymis is where the sperm is created and it's generally stored. Um, it's like this long convoluted tube that bunches together and essentially forms kind of a, the shape of the testicle. Um, it stores sperm for two to 10 days that then moves through the vas deferens and then through the, I believe, erectile duct through the prostate into the urethra. 
Um, the urethra transports urine and semen, but not at the same time. And there are actually some physiologic designs to try and prevent that. Yeah, there's stuff that we have experiences about that the ladies don't get. There's all sorts of different things, too. We're unique, too. Um, the jokes yeah. aside, though, that's something that probably Chris is the only one in this room that will also understand. There are physio physiologic things that kind of prevent that from happening. That's just kind of like a you can turn left or you can turn right. You can't turn left and right at the same time. Um, and it's voluntary? It's I'm just, sorry, oh, sorry. it's men, essentially, you cannot urinate and ejaculate at the same time. Yeah, um, with an erection, it makes it really difficult to urinate, but there are some physiologic changes that, like, mm. the prostate closes up around the... So you cannot do that. Exactly. It's, it's one like or the other. It's like the glute and, and breathe. Yeah, exactly, yep. The, the glution close the breathing passage. Exactly. Oh, okay. One or the other. Oh, okay. Um... Let's see, most of what comes out is not actual sperm, it's cemental fluid, which is actually just prostate fluid, which is supposed to lubricate the whole deal and get the sperm where they're supposed to go and kind of keep them in an environment that's uh, useful for them. Um, accessory glands, blah, 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 yeah. Yeah, nothing, nothing hugely different here that we need to address. Um, okay, anatomy of the female reproductive system. So now the actual course that we're here for. Um, I feel like we've already covered pretty much all the external and internal anatomy, but again, ovaries. What do we call the ovaries, the Latin term? Gonads. What do we call the technical term, or the testicles in Latin? Gonads. Gonadotropins are the things, the hormones that are released from your testicles, your ovaries. Um, external genitalia have extensive venous supplies. So that is something to be aware of with women, that it's not just like men. It's, um, I believe, like the testicular um, skin surface has a decent amount of blood flow, but there's Generally speaking, just on the pubic area, there is not nearly as much blood flow or vasculature as for women because they have kind of the external genitalia. Um, let's see. Yeah, in the event of any kind of trauma, um, bruising and swelling are common. It's something that, um, in the sense, I know it says sexual trauma, but this is really just any kind of trauma related. Like, oh, you went horseback riding for the first time, or, oh, you gave birth, or like anything that you can think of that's an abnormal event that's creating an extra stress, you are going to have a higher likelihood of some degree of soft tissue injury because of that vasculature. Um, and collectively, that external genitalia we refer to as the vulva. What have been before in gymnastics? Okay, so. yes. <laughs> Jesus. Splitting a beam. Yes, that is true. <laughs> it's traumatic. Not fun. Not fun. <laughs> I was walking on the beam in middle school. This little octopus beam, they called it, and I yeah, had to go fall. Yep. You never forget those. No, you don't. Split the beam, too. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fun. I really, I actually was in gymnastics when I was a super young lad, and I <laughs> split the beam one time and never again. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. was the end of that story. Um, I feel like it helped with when I eventually got interested in rock climbing, though. Um, all right, mons pubis, um, the pad of fatty tissue covered by coarse hair or coarse skin and pubic hair, protects the pubic symphysis. That is. The uh, body out. Does he have a name? Yeah, do we have a name for her? 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 Nope. No? All right. If anyone comes up with a name, toss it out. Um, but literally, like right here is where that pubic synthesis is going to sit. Let's see if I can get the guts out. Um, Okay, so it's sitting right here, and there's kind of that layer of fatty tissue on top. Um, 
Bless you. Bless you. Uh, there's also, so the labia majora extends down. I'll put the whole thing out. It extends down both sides too, so this doesn't have a particularly prominent labia, mm -hmm. um, but they can, depending on the person, they can be pretty prominent if, um, and depending on the situation too, because it's vascular, if it gets filled with blood, it'll be more uh, prominent than if it weren't. Uh, but there's also just a lot of different glands in that area. It's like all of the, you know, like we have all of our glands in our armpits too. I'm not trying to equate lady parts with armpits, it's not gross in any way. It just is what it is when you have um, an area that secretes a lot, that has a lot of blood flow, is what it's meant to do. So um, let's see, a lot of what will be secreted are things that are meant to protect the normal healthy environment of the vagina or to facilitate reproduction. Um, let's see, labia minora. So, on the outside, the majora, on the inside, you can see they're not prominent at all, but there are kind of two in there. Um, so those secretions are specifically trying to maintain vaginal health. That's what's going to really control like pH and all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to be the one that goes into all that, but I, you know, spend 10 seconds on the soapbox of support your own natural health. There's nothing wrong with you that needs to be fixed. Like the whole like wash it out with a hose idea that we had, not healthy and not helpful um, because your body is already doing its own things to create an environment that's meant to support what's going on in you. So don't disrupt that, support it. Um, and then the foreshad is basically the area at the base in between um, the, and oh no, the baby's running away, oh, no. uh, between the inferior end of the vaginal opening and the anal opening. Um, also known as the obstetric perineum. Why are we talking about this? Well, Sometimes there is trauma that can happen during birth and this can tear. This is generally where it will tear if there is any tearing. They grade it based on the severity. It can tear a little bit. It can tear all the way through. Tearing all the way through is incredibly traumatic and a lot of the times can be prevented um, with a prophylactic episiotomy. Now I say this, don't, oh, that is not the standard of care. Don't right. go slicing was, and dicing. It, was, huh? it used to be the standard of care was just slice them open, make it easy. That's not, no, you hit them with the big intervention if they have a big problem, like high risk for a, four de or a full degree tear. Yes, that's a huge problem. Then go for it. But if they have a low risk of tearing, there's no reason to be slicing and but dicing yeah, your patient. I, I think um, that is not like a standard um, point where the decision can be made. Mm -hmm. Because um, I gave birth those days that mm -hmm. it was a standard. Mm -hmm. I did have no problem. It was beautiful. I mean, it was painful. But it was, everything was fine. Right. And these days, I've seen several, mm -hmm. including my daughter, mm -hmm. with no uh, episiotomy, mm -hmm. uh -huh. because there is not a, a standard anymore. And yeah. my poor daughter had a big injury with skin tag, and I mean, bad. That's tough. So I don't know, and, and she's not the only one. So I don't know what is the, um, the point when, you, when, when the doctor makes the decision. And that's it. The, the doctor makes a decision, but the doctor's decision isn't necessarily always right. And uh -huh. it's, not a, it's not necessarily on them in the sense of they can't, they're not, they're the doctor, not God, if they can't predict what's going to happen in the future. So it's we're going to have the back and forth of, you know, we'll have the side effects from going too far with the preventative, mm -hmm. and then we'll have the side effects from not doing enough. And eventually we just need to try and find that healthy middle ground balance that somewhere in there, mm -hmm. there is a healthy degree of we want to prevent excess tearing, but we don't want to be slicing in the people who don't need it. Yeah. Uh, yes. You can include it in the birth plan and pre-discuss it with the 
that's a huge part too. And then the doctor will know where your level is. And then the doctor will make a call earlier rather than later. Yeah. If you're like, oh, I'm really worried okay. about tearing. Because they should you know the, the, the size of the baby, the size exactly. of the mother, and all that. And that's that where. Baby. When you, you can have a conversation about like cephalopelvic disproportion, if the baby's kind of on the bigger side, the mom's hips are on the smaller side, like those are the times to be having that conversation, not the just, all right, mom, let's get you open. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the scalpel should not be out when they're having the conversation. Um, external genitalia, I think pretty much the only prominent external genitalia that female uh, of the female anatomy is the clitoris. Um, it's essentially their analog of the glands of the penis. Um, it's the sensitive, most sensitive part of the genitalia. It's just generally a giant bundle of nerve fibers. Um, let's see. <laughs> I actually have not I mean, like, I'm, you know, I'm not a women's health expert, but I, I can't recall having read this. The vaginal vestibule. Is, I've never heard vestibule being used in that term, but it's a perfect description for it. Like, a, a vestibule um, on the East Coast is when, uh, I mean, there are many different words for different things, but winter hits, you want to have a door in front of the door to your restaurant so people won't open it up and snow comes flying in, then you put a vestibule in. It's like the entrance to the entrance, and that's exactly what this is. But, but it's an entrance to protect the inside. It's exactly what that is, the entrance to protect the inner entrance. So you're going to have all these smaller entrances from there. Um, that's where the urethral meatus is. That's where urine is coming out. It does not come out the same place the baby comes out. I'm sure all of you are aware of that. It's tragic how it is not just general common knowledge, though. Um, let's see. Skein ducts um, create a lot of lubrication. Um, the vaginal introitus um, is like the actual membranous kind of pulling together. That's what creates that separation between the actual inner, uh, internal genitalia and external genitalia. Um, let's see, it's marked by the hymen, um, before it gets broken at some point in a woman's life. And there are many ways that it can get broken. Um, let's see. Perineum, um, perineum has a lot of muscle in it, and that's also one of the reasons, thankfully, that we can actually, you can actually recover from the episiotomies decently, is because of the muscle and vasculature. It's something that can heal itself pretty quick. Um, it allows stretching for birth, and it allows for a little bit of trauma recovery. If it were, like for example, a tendon, you know, break and then you're hosed for the next eight months, or uh, I don't know. Mm. All right. Uh, social implications associated with the presence of the hymen. Oh, I didn't say it explicitly. One of you has to. It can be destroyed during your first sexual experience, as well as horseback riding, bicycle riding, and any other kind of trauma that would happen down there. Yes. Um, yeah, falling off a tree, sp splitting a beam. Um, that's the social implications are, you know, and this is where they touch on it in this class, but it's just not the scope of our class to dive into the deep end of the sociology end of things. Um, but it's associated with virginity. So a young woman who has an intact hymen is quote unquote, you know, pure. And I am using that in the specific ridiculous sense because it does not mean that she hasn't had sex or has had sex. It actually does not, you know, have a terribly high correlation because of the higher correlation with just bike riding, horseback riding, yada, yada, yada. So it really is just kind of the societal or social or cultural metric that gets held up in certain, um, certain cultural groups is like, oh, this is the sign that she was pure on her wedding night, or, oh, this is the sign of this, that, or the other. Well, there's never a perfect sign about this, that, or the other. Welcome to the real world. Um, hymen is not a reliable indicator of sexual activity. Perineum can also tear during the delivery process. The perineum can tear during traumatic sexual experiences. Um, 
the hymen can stretch and not tear during a sexual experience and remain for the most part intact. Um, and then later on be broken at a different or... time. Yes, it's elastic. So it can remain intact, kind of be stretched out in a weird direction and then get broken down later on down the line. You're like, oh my God, where the hell is this blood coming I from? <laughs> That's... But in the past, I mean, it's crazy, but um, in Mexico, mm -hmm. in the past, 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 um, after the the honey, honeymoon, mm -hmm. um, there was a, like a parade mm -hmm. with the bed sheets. Yep, the whole the sheets But up. you know what, uh, then they discovered that not all the women bleed. <laughs> when when they um uh, yeah lost the community yeah. or whatever it doesn't necessarily bleed yeah so it was confusing <laughs> I can imagine I so would be confused you can lie yeah <laughs> um all right so moving on to the internal genitalia um. The vaginal canal ends at the cervix. Uh, the cervix is where, I don't know how much we're going to dive into contraceptive stuff, but if you have an IUD, that T shape is sitting right here. That's the T. The wings are sitting right here, making sure it doesn't fall back in and then get embedded inside of your cervix, or not your cervix, your, thank you, uterus. <laughs> Like, I know the words. My brain is just a little slower. Um, yeah, so you don't want it embedding in your uterus. So it sits right there, and there's that little string to pull it out. Um, so moving in from the uterus, uh, I'm sorry, from the cervix, you have the uterus. The uterus is this whole thing right here. You see, there's pointing uterus. Mm -hmm. Well, the uterus has a couple of layers. Remember, endocardia, endocardium, myocardium, pericardium. Well, same deal. Endo. Myo, peri. So endometrium is what grows throughout your cycle and then gets shedded at the end of your cycle. That's kind of endometrium, what are endothelial cells? Those are skin cells or mucosal cells. This is the top layer that throughout the period it's getting ready to grab on and implant an egg and start fertilizing. Oh no, it didn't happen. Okay, we gotta all get out of here. So it's that endometrium that's getting flushed out each month. Um, and if you have, for example, a woman who's on a depot uh, injection of uh, progesterone, uh, depot Provera, then she might, when she comes off of that long-term injection, have a specifically heavy period because her endometrium had built up through a cycle and then was just kind of slowly growing through time. Not in a dramatic way, but there was just no shedding. So it's all going to catch up with you in a little bit. That's an important thing to let your patients know if they're coming off of one of those long-acting um, hormonal birth controls that uh, suppresses periods, is that they might have a particularly heavy flow for the next couple of periods. All right. Vagina is a tubular structure, muscle and membrane that connects the external female genitalia to the uterus. Um, rugae, just the physical structures. Um, that's the, like, if you look at, I guess it's not on the slide anymore, but how it has kind of these ring shapes. That's those ring shapes, the rings can expand and contract. That's the el elasticity that expands and contracts both during sex and delivery of babies. All right, the vagina is self cleansing pH four to five, don't mess with your pH. It's the way it's supposed to be. Alterations in pH, I don't even wanna say may, they just eventually will lead to bacterial infection because the uh, vaginal pH is your first line of defense against having any sort of pelvic infection. Um, functions of the vagina provide a passageway for sperm, allow menstrual fluid and anything else that needs to come out of the uterus to get out, and provide a method for the fetus to come out as well. Um, uses of douches should be reviewed with female patients because it alters the normal chemical balance of the vagina. All right, well, that was kind of them. They put it explicitly on the slides, uh, kind of dancing around it. 
It's not to say no douching ever. It's just, it's a conversation to have with your patient. Risks, benefits. There are not all that many situations where the benefits are, you know, where it stacks up so the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, so what are the physiologic implications? It's gonna the microbiome. Changes the microbiome. It's gonna mess with your pH. So is it medically recommended? Douching was invented by douche companies to sell more douches. Mm -hmm. All right, that's all I have to say about that. I'm not a communist. <laughs> I, just, oh I just read a lot. <laughs> um, all right, what affects vaginal pH? It's those secretions. Um, your body has all these glands. That it is a very, very vascularized portion of your body for a reason. It's maintaining a specific environment, just like your gut. Your gut is really vascular. Why? Because it has to pull all the nutrients that you're going to use to survive out. Well, if it's doing that, it needs to have a, a conducive environment to pull the nutrients out. Same deal with having a conducive environment to keep you healthy. Um, what are going, <laughs> what's going to affect vaginal health? Antibiotic therapy. So what's the problem with antibiotic therapy? In what way? Kills good and bad. Kills the bacteria. So what's going to happen if you kill all the vaginal bacteria? There's nothing left in there. No defense. It's going to increase the risk of bad bacteria. Of bad bacteria or? STD. What's your side effect condition that you're likely to get from women that are taking antibiotics? UTI. UTI. UTIs are on there, but I'm actually I'm thinking of a different one. Yeast. There we go. Yeast infections. Um, so the ways that it affects the microbiome of the vagina, you've got bacteria that are in there. They do a better job than yeast of using the normal vaginal environment to live. So they're going to beat yeast if it's the normal environment. But if you go giving someone antibiotics and killing them out, then the yeast doesn't have to compete with anybody. So then the yeast starts spreading like crazy, and then you have a yeast infection. Same thing with thrush. That's, there's an association with oral thrush and antibiotic use. Um, frequent douching will affect pH. Using vaginal sprays, for the love of God, please do not spray chemicals into your body in, in any of your openings. Uh, men or women, <laughs> only water. Um, and even then, only in the places where water is supposed to go. Deodorant sanitary pads. That's, again, um, this is one where I don't know if it'll specifically affect pH, but um, any patients that have any sort of complaints that sound like endometriosis. And what is the difference between endometriosis and just the regular period pain? Generally, what I use as the differentiator is can they localize the pain somewhere? Like if they say, oh, sometimes when I get my period, my thighs really hurt. Or, oh, I get really sick to my stomach and it hurts like here, you know, not like, yes, there's the normal cramping, there's normal um, inflammation, but if they can localize a very specific spot that's not around their genitalia, that's a sign of endometrial tissue in that area causing inflammation. Uh, part of the difficulty in diagnosis is it can only be confirmed through surgical identification. So this is where you have to sit with your patient and talk to them about their life and their experiences and get to know them a little. Um, but where was I going with this? I was going with telling your patients that have endometriosis or have any sort of risk, they should not use tampons. Do not use tampons if you have endometriosis. Now this my next statement, I don't know about the evidence base, but I'm going to reach out and say, do not use the diaphragms if you have endometriosis. Um, the reason that you shouldn't use tampons is because of an association with what we call retrograde flow, which is where because the blood is still sitting in the vaginal canal, it can flow back up. And because it flows back up, that predisposes that endometrial tissue to then adhering in a different part of the body that it's not supposed to. So you don't want to plug the fluid of somebody who that fluid might cause them problems. Um, somebody that's got endometriosis, you should really encourage them to use pads um, or, you know, whatever else y'all ladies know about that stuff more than I do. Completely.
Exactly. Yeah, he'll figure it out. Chris, <laughs> tell him to be responsible about it. They'll figure it out better than we will. Another thing that is not um, in the list mm -hmm. is hot tubs. Ooh, yes, hot tubs. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's one too that can be really, really determined by the chemistry of the hot tub too, because it's. it's just, mm -hmm. yeah. um, all right. So the uterus. What is it? It is the womb, a hollow muscular organ meant to hold a baby, shaped like an upside down pear. So it can hold this upside down pear shaped thing. It lies between the bladder, the rectum, and the vagina, supported by a whole bunch of ligaments. It essentially sits on the pelvic floor and then stretches it all out. Um, is what it is. And then you, you know, do all your stretches to get it back, and then babies come again, and then such is life. Fundus in the corpus. All right. Now we're getting into actual like maternal nursing. The fundus is probably the one anatomical part in the labor and delivery unit that you will hear talked about the most. Um, is essentially that is the bulge of the uterus where the baby is pressing out on the bottom. It's like the point where you put the fetal heart rate monitor on. It's the point where kind of they're closest to the surface. Um, let's see. So yeah, your uterus has a nerve supply, but you are not deciding when you're going to go into labor. You're not deciding when you're going to contract when you're in labor. It is not voluntary. Um, it's something that is controlled by hormonal changes. All right, the cervix. The cervix is what separates your uterus from the vaginal canal. It's what dilates during the birthing process. Um, it'll go from, you know, so tiny you can't see through it, and it hurts to push that tiny, tiny IUD through it, to literally to like 10 centimeters. Show a whole baby's head through it. Um, see, it's not just a literal circle because you can't have you know, a two-dimensional object. It, it has to be a tube. It's a very short tube, but it's a tube. So there's an internal Oz and an external Oz. That's just the fancy words for saying the opening that's more on the inside and the opening that's more on the outside. So it's the uterine opening and the vaginal opening or the internal and the external Oz. Um, mucosal lining has multiple functions, lubrication, bacteriostasis, providing an alkali environment to shelter burn and creating a mucus plug during pregnancy to prevent bacteria from getting up towards that baby, among other things. The fallopian tubes, these are the most common sites of ectopic pregnancies. What are those? The tubes that connect the ovaries to the uterus. Yes, they are the tubes that connect the ovaries to the uterus. And what's an ectopic pregnancy? When in, and the tubes are outside of the, the uterus. Because yeah. Ovaries are not actually connected to the fallopian Yes, exactly. Um, the term ectopic pregnancy is negatively defined. It's just any pregnancy that's not in the uterus. So it might be in your fallopian tubes. That's the most common. It can actually be in your peritoneum. You mean like the middle of your abdomen. That's why they're medical emergencies, because there's no way to get that baby out other than cutting you open. You want to cut you open before it pops out. All right. Uh, let's see. See. Yeah, so as you're saying, there's not an actual direct connection. Like it's not a tube that goes into the ovary itself. So that's why, that's part of the reason why there is the risk for ectopic pregnancy because you have the infundibulum, these fender like projections that are meant to capture the eggs as they come out of the ovaries, but they don't bat a thousand. They're not perfect. So if the egg gets somewhere else and sperm happens to meet it, then you've got a baby that's forming wherever it may be, not where you want it. Um, all right, so what are the functions of the fallopian tubes? Um, essentially transportation and fertilization. This is typically where fertilization happens. Typically, this is where the sperm meets the ovum, fertilization happens, and then transportation down to the uterus and implantation happens down there. It's not that the egg and the sperm meet in the uterus. 
So again, why do we have ectopic pregnancies? Well, what if the uh, what if the egg doesn't then migrate down into the uterus? What if it gets met by the sperm and just stays there? Then it's stuck in the fallopian tubes. Um, let's see, the ampulla are the usual site of fertilization. Then there's a narrowing before the uterus, and then the interstitial section is kind of the tie into the uterus. Um, ovaries are almond shaped. Let's see, do I have them easily visible on here? Not all that much. Oh. Oh, well, um, they're not very big. They're the size of a walnut or so. They're about the same size as testicles um, because they're anatomically, evolutionarily came from the same uh, original structure. Um, two functions produce hormones and stimulate maturation of ovum during each reproduction cycle. Um, so the ovaries, it is important to note, it's not just the production of eggs. The ovaries are what regulate your hormonal changes throughout your menstrual cycle. Um, let's see, at birth you have every egg that you will ever have and see by adulthood it's in the thousands this is something that i i always thought you know, when i was learning this like oh, okay there's a finite number of eggs and then you have one come out each time and then eventually you run out then it must be like 300 eggs or 500 eggs but no actually a lot of them just kind of like die or disappear or drop out most of them don't actually turn into uh mature ova um Let's see. So eventually your body will be like, all right, I'm done with this. And then menopause happens. Um, functions of the bony pelvis. So uh, I find it fascinating that they have these very, very specific names for anatomical shapes of the pelvis, but no pictures of the pelvis. Um, there are different shapes that your pelvis can have that influence different vaginal orientations. In addition to the different pelvic shapes, there are different vaginal orientations. All of those can play into someone's experience with sex, birth, and everything else that is related to their vagina because or their pelvis, because that's what it is. Um, the, let's see, yeah, there's different types that are more or less favorable for vaginal deliveries, but an unfavorable type for vaginal delivery does not mean that it can't be done. It just means that there is higher risk for complications, like for example, cephalopelvic disproportion. Cephalo, head, pelvic, pelvis, disproportion. The head's too big for the pelvis. Okay, well, that makes sense. And then, <laughs> yep. So yeah, we'll talk about the pubic synthesis soon enough. Oh, here we go. Okay, so this is what you want to see um, in the sense of you better hope your patient has a pelvis. The gynecoid pelvis, this is just the biggest, openest, roundest pelvis you can have versus kind of a squash, squished in like a platypus bill. I don't think that that's why they call it platypeloid, but who knows, maybe it is. Wow. Um, so what happens when your baby is this big and it's not gonna fit? Well, pretty much every woman while you are in labor you have this piece of cartilage and it is going to break. Um, that's one of the ways that we can tell on an autopsy whether or not a woman is given birth if there's fusion lines on the pubic symphysis that indicate it is broken and refused. It is meant to be broken. Um, it's meant to open up at some point during your labor process to reduce the likelihood of that head too big for the pelvis condition. Um, Let's see. Yeah, so the external size of the pelvis is not really all that directly related to the internal size. Like, yes, there is a correlation of you make something bigger, it's going to scale slightly, but there's an internal opening that if you looked at those different um, diagrams, the internal opening didn't really relate to the external size very much. And the internal opening is the one that you have to worry about. Um, let's see, separated by an imaginary line. So the false pelvis is everything that's not actually the pelvis. Basically, like if you were to 
shove your hands into your body and follow the pelvic floor and lift up all that stuff that you could lift up is the false pelvis until you're hitting the bone you're not in the true pelvis pelvic inlet um this is where during pregnancy the healthcare provider will make inferences about the adequacy of the mother's pelvic opening this is where you figure out how big the actual internal pelvic opening is and this is something that is very invasive and is something that will be done by the gynecologist not by the random nurse joel or so and so um let's see these are different things that can be assessed during manual exams they can be assessed other ways too but that's probably the least um invasive way and that's also telling the least invasive method to measure it is manual manual examination of the internal structures so that's pretty invasive um pelvic outlet the coccyx can move or break during the passage of the fetal head that's your tailbone um an immobile coccyx can decrease the size of the pelvic outlet it's essentially stuff that's stiff means it's not going to be as accommodating for flexibility so it's going to kind of hold it and keep it stiffer um, adequate pelvic me measurements are essential for successful vaginal birth essentially this is where we're trying to relate that standard of care okay if you are going to have or if your hips are tiny and your baby's head is big then maybe you are not a great candidate for the home birthing center maybe you're high risk for a c-section because we feasibly don't know how we're going to get this body out of you that is one way to assess but it's about making those decisions beforehand making them with the patient and trying to make them in a way where it's being given to the patient for them to make an informed choice about their situation rather than just oh yes here you are thank you for coming to our hospital we will see you soon for your delivery um like it's we really want to be engaging people in a healthcare relationship not just in a healthcare oh you come to the healthcare store and then you know you get your card swiped and off you go um adequate pelvic measurements essential yada 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 okay this is telling you the exact specific measurements so because it's not a circle it is a weird oblique shape we measure it in three different directions um because they really will literally like be finagling shoulders in this way and that way and babies are made to get finagled a certain degree um but they really really do need to know what those measurements are because if it's too small it's going to be too small and here's where we get those measurements of the baby's head of if <laughs> if the pelvis is 12 and the head is 13 13 is simply bigger than 12 like if you know there's a certain degree of oh it's close we can probably make things happen but there's also situations where they will be clear cut oh yeah and then baby's head will actually get smaller if it grew. yeah and here um a lot of the women in my family said that when they they got the baby they were trying to see the size of their child that it, it's incorrect like they were told they were smaller than they actually were and that maybe happened Mm -hmm. quite often because it can be kind of hard to see yeah. Yeah. yeah I feel like it would probably and this is again me speculating because oh I'm such an expert in OB nurses my patients mm -hmm. have already gone through menopause um it's easier to assess the internal opening of a bony structure that's not going to change at all I think than a baby that's moving around growing you know they're they're kind of squishy to begin with so yeah I feel like it that makes sense um all right breast anatomy um honestly i can't really think of anything super important anatomy wise kelsey was asking me a couple of weeks ago if women who don't have a lot of breast tissue have difficulty uh creating milk and actually it's the other way around it's if you have a lot of breast tissue it can increase the pressure um the interstitial pressure on your tissues and decrease milk production um so it's your milk production is not just happening in like just the breast tissue like it's it's a complicated process it's not just like bigger breasts means more milk smaller breasts means less milk um all right produce milk after birth provides nourishment for the infant provides antibodies for approximately six months 
if I, as a healthcare provider, as a nurse scientist can tell you, like, if I had to give one reason why breastfeeding is important, it is because there are antibodies in breast milk. The baby comes out with essentially no immune system and they build their immune system over six to eight months. Well, you can either be giving them a supplement immune system, like you're essentially giving them passive immunity, or you can just let them battle it out. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's cheaper. <laughs> Breast size does not play a factor in the ability of the glands to produce milk. Yeah, that is a relevant consideration. Mm -hmm. um, discuss ability of a woman to breastfeed after augmentation or reduction that can affect ability. Um, what secretes milk if the alveoli carries milk, ducts, stores milk, ampulla? Man, all these Latin words. You know, like ampules, you got the ampule of medication. Well, the ampules of breast milk, same thing. Except it's not glass and you don't break it. That would be terrifying if you could give that to a small baby. All right, reproductive and menstrual cycles. Um, age of menstrual cycle onset is younger today than in previous generations. Why? We know, right? No. Because the food. Is the question? Because the food? Yeah, that is a, a very a very serious scientific um, uh, study mm -hmm. where the um, the uh, girls who were having very young the menstruation, mm -hmm. um, um, they were being fed with uh, cows, cows, cows uh, no. with um, the hormones. Hormones. So the, the girls, I mean, everybody, right. uh, we are eating the hormones mm -hmm. and are making changes in the girls and they are having periods very young, like seven. That's uh, terrifying. Seven, yeah, so that's why the study. Yeah, I think mean, diet, food is a huge part. There's also just in our modern world, there's all of these different environmental exposures that we're getting to chemicals, to hormones, to all sorts of different things. So it's not something that it's an easy, there's only one cause, just like there's never only one cause no. of something, but that is a huge portion of it. How do we address that? What do we do? Like, this is where healthcare is going in your generation. And you as healthcare providers will be the ones trying to figure out, okay, how do we maximize health when our world is a part of the thing that's making people sick? Yeah, let's have our own cows. Then you get in love with your cows and you are not gonna eat them. <laughs> <laughs> that and then you're just me. then you're just some vegetarian hippie just farming and milking cows and being nice to people. We can't have that. We can't have too many hippies out there. Um, <laughs> like scheming on communes. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we have follicle stimulating hormone and god what does lh stand for Lutein, Which was, uh, luteinizing hormone luteinizing thank you is lute something um it's these are the hormones that are precipitating your menstrual cycle changes so your ovaries are kind of the conductors of that symphony they're the ones that are letting the hormones go and they're letting the body know what to do and then the body follows suit um, the follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are the ways your ovaries communicate that signal to the rest of your body. Maturing ovum and corpus luteum produce increased amounts of estrogen and progestin. Um, surge of LH stimulates final maturation. This is really, really surface level and we'll go a little bit deeper into the menstrual cycle when we cover it. Uh, development of breasts is usually one of the first parts of uh, sexual maturation for women. Generally, you have menarche a little bit afterwards, but this is not a guarantee, and this is something that is hormonally driven. So if you mess with hormones, then you start seeing things that are different. Um, early cycles are often irregular, and this is also something you might see. Um, you might see really late cycles for people too, really delayed puberty. Um, people, young women starting getting their first uh, period at 16, 17, and then having a 45 day cycle and then a 15 day cycle and mm -hmm. then another 45 day cycle and they're worried that they got pregnant and it's these are things that these are the things that we don't talk to our patients a lot about because yeah it's a little oh we don't want to confuse them with this 
But what if you just, you know, got to chat with some young women about their changing bodies and this is where things are going. We're going to be getting nurses back into the classroom soon enough. Um, these are things that the county, like we are, these are things we're trying to put energy into. So having those conversations with young women, making sure that they understand more about their bodies, like, hey, when you're young, your cycle is more likely to be irregular. Then they're less likely to be freaking out about it. They're just less likely to have a miserable time for an evening or a week or God only knows how long. Um, all right. Typically, women reach their height, their final height before men do. Um, their hips broaden. The pubic and axillary hair appears generally around menarche. Um, puberty and the onset of menstruation begins younger today, as we just said. Um, this is the this is the specific chart that we will go when we're doing the menstrual cycle. You will all be very well familiar with this. It's not complicated. It just looks overwhelming when you look at it all shoved into one slide with no explanation. And we're not going to dive into 20 minutes of explanation because this is the introduction to the rest of the course, not the actual specifics. So don't be freaking out about it. Um, but I will just say, look on here. This is showing the endometrium. Mm -hmm. See, at the start of the cycle, it's nice and thin. And then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then your body realizes no egg is coming, so then it thins out. And then that's your period. And it's the old endometrium getting out, so some new endometria can be in there ready for the next cycle. Um, ovulation, mature ovum is released from the follicle 14 days before the onset of your period. Um, let's see. Essentially, this is marked by increased progesterone secretion. If you are just taking blood levels every single day, you start ovulating when your progesterone spikes. Um, let's see, then the corpus luteum degenerates if it's not fertilized, and eventually once it degenerates to a certain level, your hormone levels drop, and the endometrium will then break down and start falling out. Yes? Um, you, you said something about a, a, a blood, like a test blood. <laughs> is, is that true that um, that is um, um, a test to like pregnancy test, but to see the days, the exactly day that uh, the, the women are ovulating. So, um, so in that sense, you could do that, but there's a lot easier way. Just use a thermometer. Oh. Um, so with your cycle, I, I won't jump back to it um, because we will talk about it at length in the future, but there's the ups and downs of the hormone blood levels, and you'll have a spike in progesterone before ovulation. So if you're drawing blood each day, then one day you see, oh, progesterone's really high. Then you uh -huh. can say, oh, you're ovulating today. Uh, okay. But it also really affects vaginal temperature. Um, you need to get a baseline because you're not, uh, it's not like, oh, if you're ovulating, it's at 98.6 degrees or 90, 99.3 degrees. It's very specific for each person. They have your baseline. You, yes, exactly. Afterwards. You'll have a baseline throughout your cycle and you will see a definite deviation from the baseline when you begin ovulating. Um, that's, I actually used to joke, what do you call uh, people who use the calendar method uh, mm -hmm. as contraceptives, mm -hmm. parents. Um, but if you use that method coupled with um, temp taking temperature readings, it's actually really, really accurate. Um, all right. Oh, God. Female patient reports her menstrual cycle consistently occurs every 32 days. What day of her cycle can she anticipate ovulation? 32 minutes 14. There you go. Is this thing? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it was in there somewhere. I knew there was an eight. Um, but yeah, that's really it. You ovulate 14 days before the end of your cycle, no matter how long the cycle is. Thirteen or 32 minus 14. All right, human sexual response. So 
This is getting a little bit more on the psychology end, like this four phases comes from psychologic experimentation or theoretic work that was done in the 60s on human sexuality. Um, the L excitement, plateau, orgasmic, and resolution phases. Um, there's This is, if it's interesting to you, its own whole field that I just, I only chuckle at it being included here because I think it's completely appropriate for us to be teaching you. I just don't understand why it's lumped in with maternal and childhood nursing. I think it's something that's much more like med surge. This is just general human health. It's not affecting only women. Yes? It follows the same cycle as hmm. a lady cycle, and then it also helps you figure out when the worst time to get, have sex is because it's the most likely time you're going to get knocked up. Yes. Those statements are also very much based on perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I feel like one thing that we always have to remember is our patients might have the exact opposite goals <laughs> as we do when it comes to family planning. Whichever... It's the best time to get that. It's like gotcha. either the worst or the best time. Either the, best the worst time. or the best, depending on the goals for the patient. Um, so the human sexual response is isolated to specific sexual events rather than an overall periodic cycle. The human sexual response is the way that you respond to sexual stimuli. Um, there's an excitement phase and that is essentially the, uh, I would call it capture. Like if somebody is going to have a sexual response or not, it starts with the excitement phase. They either latch to the stimulus and will start having a physiologic response to it or they won't. If you are overwhelmed by other stimuli, you're not going to be able to latch on to one stimulation that is related to sexuality if you are worried about, oh my God, I need to go get you know ingredients so I can make food because I haven't eaten in three days. That's just the basic Maslow's hierarchy thing. Um, then plateau, this is essentially the sustainment. Um, this is where people get flushed skin. Uh, Started watching Love Island. I don't know the trashy <laughs> Netflix show. Oh my God! There it is. I okay. That's going to be our seminar. It's going to be watching that and then discussing game theory and human <laughs> psychology of like, well, we're coupled up, and so basically we can't look at anyone else, even though we met each other two days ago when we came on this dating show to date other people. <laughs> Anyway, uh, so when one of them comes on and they're in Casa Amor and <laughs> getting temptation, I'm sorry, uh, when they're getting tempted by the random new person that's come in who's like, oh yeah, I need to get into the show, I have to get someone to want me, then their whole job, they're just trying to get you to make out with them. They're trying to start the excitement phase and get you into the plateau. Well, I... Yeah, you're getting me all hot. That means I am in the plateau phase. Like that statement, I feel like there's always someone saying that. Mm -hmm. They're in the plateau phase. Orgasmic, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar or have heard, at least have heard tell of what happens. At least. Oh, <laughs> I, I, for, on the... Yeah. On the spectrum of human experiences, I hope you all experience human things. Um, this is where the voluntary becomes involuntary, and this is essentially the only human experience that you will have where the voluntary does become involuntary, where you don't really have a choice in it, and where you're trying to push towards a point where you will have an involuntary reaction. There's not really any other human reactions where you're doing that. Um, I think, <laughs> funny enough, um, sneezing is one of the only other things that I can think of that's somewhat similar, similar. And there's a lot of people that will describe sneezing as like a micro, micro orgasmic orgasm. feeling. Orgasm, yeah, it's, that's what I've heard. It's an How involuntary an feeling that you're trying like, to precipitate. Yeah, like when you want to sneeze and finally, mm -hmm. you sneeze, that's an orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> I had heard one person say that to another person. They're like, wow, I feel bad for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. um, so orgasmic reactions are whole body reactions that are driven by a very, very dramatic change in chemistry. Um, it's an ionic change. There's, uh, you know, when we talk about all the voltage gated channels for your muscles and stuff, 
it's essentially that's happening, but instead of movement of arms or legs, that's just the side effect, but the primary effect is you're having a good time. Um, and why? Because the world needs babies so we can have people. Um, and then resolution, there's generally, we call it a postcoital period. Um, there's a period of time where you're going to have a refractory period. You're going to want to lay down or just rest for a minute. Um, something that's interesting with that because of these vital sign changes, um, it's not terribly common, but these happen. Postcoital headaches. Someone like just randomly like, you know, just doing their Sunday <laughs> afternoon thing and then like all of a sudden, oh my god, my head! It's never happened to any of you. I just never put two and two. It would be similar to high blood pressure headaches. Yeah, it's similar to hypertension headaches. It's from the increase uh, in pressure in your, or increased intra intracranial pressure um, from vasodilation. Um, and it's something that can happen intermittently. It can happen kind of periodically, or it can happen a lot. It's generally something that does not happen though with regularity for people. It's something that someone might come in and be like, I had this terrifying experience last week. But it's not very often that they're gonna be like, I can't ever do this thing that I wanna do. Um, that does happen, but that's really the exception, not the norm. All right, physiology of the male sex. <laughs> I like how they phrase it like it's happening in isolation. Um, massaging action of intercourse stimulates nerves. <laughs> so clinical. Parasympathetic relaxation of arteries leads to increased blood flow, um, causes an erection. Um, it's just, I think the one thing that's interesting to note with the male sex act is this interesting kind of push and pull between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous stimulation. That the parasympathetic nervous system is what's being stimulated to cause an erection and that's relaxation of the body. But generally sex is an act that is physiologically active and intense and that's generally a sympathetic stimulation. So there's an interesting push and pull between because those. Because if you have your blood occupied in another stuffing, I mean, I'm sorry. I get you. Yeah. But it's doing different mm -hmm. stuff. Can You cannot be relaxed mm -hmm. and send the blood to another place. Exactly. That, I, it really is. It's a very, very big part of it. Um, that sexuality is a huge part psychiatric. It's a huge part psychologic because those are different things it's a huge part physiologic it's a huge part spiritual it is whatever you want to make it because that's what being a human is um let's see the urethral glands secrete mucus rhythmic contractions lead to expulsion of semen um that would be during the orgasmic phase after orgasm erection ceases cavernous Sinuses empty. What's a sinus? That mm -hmm. empty cavity. Yeah. In a specific space. An empty cavity in a space. And the cavernous sinuses. I feel like that's just kind of <laughs> doubling it up. It's a cavern and it's a sinus. <laughs> it's a um, but it's literally like what I was telling you about those inflatable tube ideas. That's exactly what it is. It's the space in the penis getting flooded with blood and then enough pressure in that blood to create structural rigidity Sponge. and then the blood will then be exiting and that pressure decreases so you lose the structural rigidity and then it becomes flaccid its arteries contract um, sperm can reach fallopian tubes within five minutes but also can remain viable for up to four or five hours Ooh, wow. yeah they're behind enemy lines trying to trying to reach their objective days i'm sorry Wow, mm -hmm. I really misread days? that. Days? Days. Days. Oh my God. Um. <laughs> God, tough little buggers. <laughs> yeah, so four to five days, four to five days. Um, yeah, I, I feel like that's a funny one to talk about, but we have a lot of content that I have not hit yet, so I'm going to keep going through on the physiology of the female sex act. Female psyche can initiate or inhibit sexual response. What is the problem that just happened right here? 
Come on, you can all point it out. You see it. What did we not? We just talked about the male sex act. Oh, that one's almost completely involuntary. No, and it's the male psyche can initiate and inhibit sexual responses too. The sexuality is a very, very much psychogenic experience. There's a physical component. There's a psychogenic component. And that is true for men and for women. Yeah. I'm there are varying degrees that you might be affected or be more predisposed to one versus another, just as some people have one love language versus another, or communicate in one way versus another. But it doesn't mean that one is, you know, like women. Oh, well, the the man, the female psyche, it's you turn them on or you turn them off. That's, that is right there what we're trying to avoid. All of our patients have this bit of psyche that can initiate or inhibit their reactions. Um, local stimulation of breast, vulva, vagina, and perennia increase sexual sensations. Is that not true for the male analogs too? It's the exact same thing. Um, women have erectile tissue. The clitoral tissue can get slightly engorged. It just does not have the same structural um, sinuses that the penis does. But with increased stimulation comes increased blood flow, and with increased blood flow comes a little bit of swelling. Um, but uh, does it have a, a um, function? Like, like ejaculation has a, a function. Yes. The when the the um, tissue in females is. Um, um, erectile mm -hmm. does it have a function um, so I will say yes and yes oh. um, so on the first sense of like what's the explicit function that's really an us thing of the we are looking for cause and effect but at the end of the day if somebody is experiencing a positive thing from sex rather than just oh it just happens they're more likely to do it they're going to want to so that's really the reason it's everybody needs a motivation so it needs to be a positive experience in order for people to want to reproduce but on a physiologic level studies have been done that show women that are more sexually aroused are more likely to become pregnant from the sex that they're having at that moment so it facilitates implantation um there's you know, I how, why, that's way above my head. Maybe it's above the researcher's head at the moment. But, it has um, <laughs> but yes, <laughs> don't listen to them. You do have a function to okay. <laughs> wanting to have some sort of experience of your own. It's because um, the orgasm in female mm -hmm. was discussed much later. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, well, the men, they're shooting the baby out, and the women, they're not shooting anything out, no. so it's useless. I'm like, no, it is useful as well, not just because it's good for you in a psychological and many other senses, uh -huh. but, physiologically. but physiologically, yes, it is a good thing. Okay. Um, posterior pituitary gland secretes oxytocin, stimulates contraction of uterus, dilation of cervical contra uh, canal. There you go. There's the yeah. physiologic answer yeah. for you right there. Yeah. You can puzzle it together without having a lab all of your own, just from what we know right there. Orgasm believed to aid in transportation of sperm into fallopian tubes. Eggs live 24 hours after ovulation. Sperm must be available during that time. All right. So why don't we take a break until 2, and then we'll... Man, is that is class end at 2? Where's my schedule? That's 3, right? Today? Yeah. Three. Three. It ends at three. Um, so we'll take a break until two, and then that will be the last hour of our lecture.